I'm going to continue my look at the causes of World War I by turning my focus to alliances and militarism. Now a few things to make clear about the alliances that were made. The first is that they were defensive in nature. And what I mean by that is that they were only guaranteed to be triggered if a member of the alliance was attacked by another power. For example, in the dual alliance, which you will look at between Austria-Hungary and Germany, either country would only support the other if it was attacked with Russia named as the likely enemy. So the alliances were not made with the intent of attacking an enemy. But enemies were nevertheless identified and plans were made and that the details of the alliances were of course secret, they were only likely to raise the level of suspicion and unease in Europe. So we see the two blocks of allies, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Italy in the Triple Alliance and France, Britain and Russia in the Triple Entente. Now a couple of things need to be made clear here too. Italy was never a reliable ally for Germany and Austria, Hungary. And so Germany always felt the need to make sure Austria, Hungary remained a firm ally. And this led Germany to support Austria-Hungary in events that were unfolding in the Balkans. This is because by taking Alsace and Lorraine in 1871, it had made an enemy of France. And by building a strong navy and so threatening Britain, it made an enemy of Britain. And by supporting Austria-Hungary in the Balkans and so threatening Russia, it had made an enemy of Russia. And so Germany found itself surrounded by what it felt were hostile powers. And so a more detailed look at the alliances. I'm not going to read out each bullet point but you should take the time to do so. But in the dual alliance, as we have noted, it was defensive in nature and it was Russia that was identified as the likely enemy. Whilst in the triple alliance, it was France that was identified as the likely enemy. And again, only an attack by France or another power was guaranteed to trigger the alliance. Now with regard to the Triple Entente, there are a few things again to draw your attention to. First of all, look at the date of the Franco-Russian alliance, 1894. It was a direct response to the Dual Alliance of 1879 and the Triple Alliance of 1882. Also note the Franco-Italian agreement that shows the unreliability of Italy to Germany and Austria-Hungary. And finally, with regard to the Entente Cordiale between Britain and France and the agreements made between Britain and Russia that led to what was known as the Triple Entente, do note that Britain was not left with any military obligation. These were agreements that resolved colonial issues themselves important, but with only a loose commitment on the part of Britain to perhaps cooperate should France or Russia or both find themselves at war. This is important as it meant that when the July crisis unfolded following the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, Britain was the only so-called great power left with any room for manoeuvre. Britain was clearly leaning towards supporting France and Russia. And so Europe was divided into two mutually suspicious camps with Italy's support up for grabs. Now another super cartoon I feel. This time an American cartoon, but again 
published two years before the war. And in this cartoon, you see how the alliances were always likely to lead to a major European war as a result of something happening in the Balkans. You see Serbia saying to Austria-Hungary, If you touch me, I'll get my pal Russia to help me out. Whilst Germany is saying to Russia, If you attack Austria-Hungary, you're going to have to deal with me too with France joining the fray, saying, Hey, Germany, if you attack Russia, I'm going to support Russia. And finally, Britain threatening to join in too. A very clever cartoon, and it shows that the world was not unaware of the dangers of what was happening in Europe. And so to militarism, and four things to point out. We have looked at the Anglo-German naval race, but we should now turn our attention to the increasing size of the armies of the major European powers, the increasing sums of money being spent on armaments and the war plans being made. So to the increasing size of armies, now again, I'm not going to read through all the bullet points in this slide, but except for Britain that relied heavily on its navy, which it was busy enlarging, the armies of all the major powers increased. So we see in the bottom bullet point that in 1914, more than 15 million men were mobilized. Three million from Austria-Hungary, a little over four million from Germany, almost four and a half million from Russia, three and a half million from France, and about 710,000 from Britain and its empire. Now, to understand how we get to those numbers mobilized in 1914, you need to understand the difference between a standing army and those numbers that were actually mobilized. Think of the standing army as the numbers currently in uniform. But all the European powers except for Britain had military service, which meant men were called upon to undertake military training for a couple of years. They would then go back to civilian life, but they had been trained and they might be obliged to undertake shorter periods of training to keep their ability to kill other people up to scratch. And that is how countries were able to mobilise such huge numbers in 1914. So to spending. Now the numbers I have on this side, slide probably won't impress you. Let's face it, footballers are bought and sold for more money these days. But you will have to trust me that they represented a lot of money at the beginning of the 20th century. And you can see that those numbers were rising sharply. And finally, the war plans that are often overlooked, but shouldn't be. The most famous plan was Germany's Schlieffen plan, designed by Count Alfred von Schlieffen in 1891 when he was head of the German army, and which planned to defeat France in just six weeks so that Germany could then concentrate its armies on the Russians, because Germany had to avoid a war on two fronts, fighting France and probably the British and the Russians at the same time. But Russia had its own plan, Plan 19A, to attack Austria-Hungary, essentially in defence of Serbia, and so in the Balkan region, but also to attack Germany, as Germany was expected to attack Russia in support of Austria-Hungary. Whilst the French also had their plan, Plan 17, which was to hold the expected German attack and to go on the attack itself, taking back the Alsace and Lorraine provinces before advancing 
into Germany. So they were all offensive plans, even if the alliances were defensive in nature. They were offensive in that they intended to attack the enemy rather than defend their own borders. And all these plans required countries to mobilize their troops quickly, that is, before the enemy did. And mobilization meant getting those civilians who had done their military training but had returned to civilian life, back to their jobs and their families, into barracks, into uniform, with a gun shoved in their hands and sent to the front as quickly as possible. Or else the war could be lost before it had begun. And this is something to think about. It will become very important in the decision making during the July crisis. Decisions that led to war. And that ends my look at the alliances and militarism. Do check out my website, History Made Easier, for written pieces. But for now, as always, I thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>